Yield curves are uninverting all over the world. It's not just U.S. Treasuries. This is a powerful and synchronized sign that conditions have worsened sufficiently that it warrants lower interest rates. And I don't just mean lower policy rates from central banks. Uninversion in this fashion is more about small e economics, actual economic conditions in Europe, in China, in the U.S., and beyond. In fact, over in Japan, the Bank of Japan, which actually wants to raise its interest rates, policymakers last Friday said they can't do it because they're that concerned about what's happening here in the U.S. Officials there went so far as to claim that they would have raised their inflation forecast for the country if not for the, quote, uncertainty swirling around the United States. In other words, even the Japanese know that a U.S. recession would greatly damage worldwide economic prospects, starting with their own. And that is just what this globally synchronized bond market uninversion wave is indicating. American recession changes everything. Central banks that are now accelerating their rate cuts are simply trying to catch up to that wave. And yes, that includes the Fed. And we've got now even more names to add to that list. Yield curve inversions are the initial warning that trouble like this may lie ahead, many times far ahead. Yield curve uninversion first confirms that warning, even if there's a very long time in between, like there has been this time around. But more than that, this bull steepening, as it's called, gives us a better sense of the timing. With so many markets uninverting at the same time and in the same way, we know what time that is. Summertime is the time for recession, and fall is when it all really heats up, so that by the time we get to winter, the economy is as frozen as the landscape. That's exactly what, well, it's mostly what Bank of Japan officials said last Friday. When the Bank of Japan wanted to hike rates even further because they think the domestic economic conditions warrant higher interest rates, while they wanted to raise rates, they can't because they're more concerned about what's happening here in the United States. As Governor Casio Weta said at his press conference, looking at consumption and other data, Japan's economy is on track and moving in line with our forecast. We could have even upgraded our view on inflation expectations based on domestic data. But uncertainty, there's that word, on the U.S. economic outlook has heightened. That is offsetting some of our optimism on inflation expectations. We don't have a specific deadline for determining if markets have stabilized after the early August fireworks there, but one factor we'd like to look at is whether the U.S. economy will achieve a soft landing or whether the slowdown could be a bit more severe. Even Weta and the Bank of Japan realizes that the, that the uh, chaos and disorder in markets in early August was related to the U.S. question. It wasn't about interest rate differentials. It was entirely about whether or not the U.S. goes into recession. That's what Japanese financial firms, that's what provoked them into liquidating their U.S. dollar asset positions and other asset positions around the world, creating the air pocket in liquidity. So as U.S. recession risk goes up or uncertainty around the U.S. economy, as they like to call it, as that gets more and more heightened, what that means is that the risks of a repeat go up too. So this, just, this isn't just about economic conditions or inflation forecasts in Japan. It's all tied to the globally synchronized signals that we're getting from bond markets, which tell us that recession risks haven't just heightened because they're not actually recession risks. That's what bull steepening and uninversion on all of these curves is saying. And I wrote about this in a recent deep dive analysis here at Eurodollar University, including how in 2007, the Bank of Japan faced similar circumstances. They wanted to keep raising rates, but opted not to because, yes, uncertainty about the U.S. economy, which was actually the right call, as the yield curves back then had said. And speaking of the DDA, it's fall, and that means we're here having our fall sale at Eurodollar University. Big price savings on subscriptions for the deep dive analysis, the daily briefing. We also have discounted memberships available where a membership gives you access to over 100 hours of videos and material, including basic series on how to read yield curves and forward interest rate curves. And I'm just about to publish the next segment in our basic series on interest rate swaps by huge popular demand. So deep dive analysis subscription, daily briefing subscription, membership, sale prices on all of those, fall sale here at Eurodollar University. Check them out at our website, eurodollar.university. 
The thing about yield curves is everyone likes to deny that they have any predictive power. Every time we go through the cycle, you hear the same things. This time is different. When the yield curve inverted in the U.S. Treasury market back in August of 2019, everybody said the same thing. This time is different. Well, the National Bank of Belgium, a central bank in Belgium, came out with a study and report in which they They've been essentially ridiculed everyone saying this time is different because, as they noted, this time is never different. What the study said was, experience shows that commentators tend to downplay the signals given by the yield curve. No kidding. In fact, when asked the question in 2007, 2000, 1990, and on earlier occasions, most economists indicated that this time is different, meaning that this time the yield curve inversion will not be followed by a recession. Yet, the study notes, a recession occurred every time. Central banks often contribute to downplaying the signals of the yield curve because of course they do. They have to. They have to lie to your face and tell you the economy is just fine and ignore all of the evidence which tells you it isn't, including the historically validated yield curve inversion. They tell you this time is different because it makes them look like they don't know what they're doing. It makes them look really bad. So they always downplay the yield curve inversion. And to be fair, the yield curve itself and the way it works makes that downplaying seem plausible because there is a lot of time in between the initial inversion and ultimately how it plays out into recession. The uninversion being the confirmation as well as the timing signal. And in many cycles, that, that period between the initial inversion and the uninversion spans several years. So that's not actually unusual, nor is it unusual for people to say, like Alan Greenspan did in 2005, quote, this is before the U.S. Senate Banking Committee, the evidence very clearly indicates that the yield curve's efficacy as a forecasting tool has diminished very dramatically. And when he said that in 2005, it seemed that just flattening yield curves were not agreeing with his position on inflation risks and economic growth being well above potential, the market was saying, no, there's this housing bubble, which is really about the monetary bubble, the late euro dollar cycle, that's likely to cause major problems at some point. We don't know what point that is, but we should not just ignore it like central bankers always tell you to do. They're not just telling you to ignore the yield curve signal, they're telling you to ignore a whole lot more. But that's inversion. We're now talking about uninversion. And in the uninversion part of the cycle, that's, as I said, a timing signal. And part of that timing signal is central banks coming to grips with the fact that this time is not actually different. I mentioned last week after the Federal Reserve cut by 50 basis points how, first of all, they said, well, this is no big deal. This is not us panicking in any way, shape or form, which is what central banks always do after they start panicking. It wasn't just the Fed. We had the Swiss National Bank, whose meeting's coming up this week, which might decide to do a 50 basis point rate cut, accelerating its schedule. The European Central Bank, especially according to what Euriber futures and other markets are pricing, they're likely to accelerate their schedule too. The way they've planned it out, European officials, is that they're going to cut rates at every other meeting. That's the gentle, soft landing um, narrative and cycle that they have envisioned. And markets are saying, nope, you're going to have to accelerate that cycle. And more recently, officials have said, yeah, we might want to we might want to speed up our rate cutting, too. Canada I talked about Canada. I'm going to talk about the Canadian bond market because that's one that's uninverting here as well. Canada, they're likely to accelerate their cycle. And when it became clear that that was a good possibility because of the economic downturn in Canada, that's when the Canadian curve uninverted. And we've got another name to add to the list. Sweden, Riksbank, the world's original central bank. Just today, the Ricks Bank cut rates and they said, we got to accelerate our pace. According to the statement, the policy rate may also be cut at the two remaining monetary policy meetings this year and a cut of half a percentage point is possible at one of these meetings. The policy rate is thus expected to be cut at a clearly faster pace than was previously communicated. Consistent with everything, other central banks panicking, bond market on inversion, macroeconomic data that's increasingly more than just heightened uncertainty, it's actually showing degradation in the economy. The Chinese central bank just yesterday going nuts, handing out rate cuts like, like, like the PPOC is Oprah on television. Everybody gets rate cuts. Everybody gets accelerated rate cuts and it's consistent with the uninversion process. 
So let's go over that process. We'll start with U.S. Treasuries because that's the one that most people pay attention to. And it's a good one to pay attention to because the signal there is increasingly strong as well. We got tiny inversions back in March of 2022, a couple years in between, the economy looks strong and resilient. As everybody says, when we go through these periods, the economy looks like it's holding up until all of a sudden it seems like it doesn't. And it's, it only seems like it doesn't because people ignore all the warning signs that pile up, really because central bankers, as the Belgium study said, central bankers downplay the risks themselves and everybody just follows the central bankers. So this is the cycle that we're seeing in the yield curve today is not at all different from what we've seen in the past. Let's go back to the great not recession. We had the first inversion there, as I mentioned, late December of 2005. So you're two years before the recession begins and really three years before everybody realized that there was a recession and how bad it was. So you have the first initial inversion back then, and we're going to focus on the two-year, 10-year spread because that's the one most people, most people pay attention to, and it's good enough for our purposes here. That came out of inversion first, the first time in March 2007 when Ben Bernanke got in front of Congress and said subprime was contained. It uninverted in the bull steepening fashion June of 2007, which was less than two months before the crisis actually began on August 9, 2007, and only a couple months before the re recession officially began in December, though according to some data like gross domestic income, as I've talked about before, that suggests that the U.S. economy may have been in recession as early as the fourth, third and fourth quarter of 2007. So when the bull steepening happened in 2007, that meant that whatever was going to happen was going to happen relatively soon. Go back one cycle further in 2001, this 2000 leading to 2001, the dot-coms. The two-year, two 10-year spread inverted in February of 2000. Uh, again, warning sign, although that one was much, much quicker. The cycle was much quicker in developing. The curve uninverted on December 27th, just days before the Fed's intermediate 50 basis point rate cut in early January. It fully inverted after that rate cut was announced, and the dot-com officially restarted in March. So just two months, really two months before the recession restart, starts, the yield curve uninverts. And the data there again shows that the that maybe the economy had fallen into recession late in the fourth quarter of 2000. I mean, the Fed's thought so. That's why they did the intermediate 50 basis point rate cut. But as I said, this is not just U.S. Treasuries. Look over in Germany. We're getting a huge, big move in bull steepening and uninversion on the German curve. The two-year, 10-year spread, for example, that was still inverted as recently as September 6th when the ECB last cut rates. And it's moved decisively positive with the two-year German shots Move, making a huge move going back to May 31st. On May 31st, the two-year in Germany was 3.08%. It's down almost a full percentage point, down all the way to 2.1% in the meantime. At the same time, the German 10-year bund has only gone down 49 basis points in yield, and there's your uninversion bull steepening. And this bull steepening, unlike in treasuries, is something we've never really seen before outside of very brief incidences in the German curve history. German curve never usually un inverts. In fact, it only inverted one time on one day in 2008. But going back to the flattening, prior, prior flattening episodes in the German curve, what you see is the two-year, 10-year spread in Germany briefly hit zero in March of 2007. Then again, you know, subprime is contained. Everything looked fine. Um, in Europe, you have to keep in mind they were more concerned about inflation than they were recession. In fact, the ECB was hiking rates in the middle of 2008 which is when we finally get to the German curve actually inverted. They caused that distortion. The two-year, 10-year spread in Germany briefly inverted on June 9th of 2008 with the UCB rate hikes, and then full and huge bull steepening on inversion August into September 2008 as it became clear that Germany, Europe, the rest of the world were not going to decouple from the United States, that there would be a deep recession associated with it. There was also a near inversion in August of 2000 before the global dot-com recession in 2001 with bull steepening happening in November 2000 heading into 2001. So consistent globally synchronized signal there, even though the German curve didn't quite get into inversion. It didn't need to. The changes in the shape of the yield curve in Germany as the changes in shape of the U.S. Treasury curve were synchronized enough. Let's also look at Canada. As I mentioned, the two-year, 10-year spread on the Canadian curve. 
That one has also made a big move since the end of May, just like Germany. We've got recession timing on all of these different places with the front end of these curves moving sharply lower in the classic bull steepening on inversion fashion. And just last week, the two-year tenure spread turned positive for the first time in the cycle, once more confirming where we are in it. It was basically on news that the Bank of Canada is looking, is seeking to be probably more aggressive, maybe even a 50 basis point rate next meeting in October as the Canadian economy shows more and more signs of becoming globally synchronized in the same way as everyone else. One final note, let's bring in the Japanese government bond curve. Even though it never inverted, it rarely inverts, even though it didn't invert, we're not talking about uninversion and bull steepening, we are getting a consistent signal out of JGBs. In fact, JGBs had been moving higher on Bank of Japan rate hikes and more aggressive policy noises from central bank officials up until the end of May. Again, consistent with the global turn in the bond markets like Germany and like Canada, the U.S. Treasury curve had moved a month before then. So even the JGB, JGB curve picked up on the same impulse. And that was despite the fact that the Bank of Japan actually hiked rates at the end of July and initially said they planned on doing more rate hikes up until more recently where they realized they actually probably can't. And what you see is that since July 11th, JGB yields have been moving lower in tandem with German yields in U.S. Treasuries and Canadian yields in other markets around the world. And July 11th, as I keep pointing out, that was the day the U.S. CPI was reported for the month of June. And it wasn't because that allowed central banks and especially Federal Reserve to be able to lower the rates to get out of their inflation stickiness mode. It was because that CPI ended up being too disinflationary that it confirmed all of the negative prospects that we're talking about here, including those that Governor Wade brought up at his press conference last week. So inversions tell you what's coming. The uninversions tell you it's here. They give you a bit of a timing as well as confirming that initial warning. And what we're getting here is uninversions in all sorts of places all around the world because this is a global system. This is not a U.S. economy. This is not a Europe thing. This is not a China thing. It's an everyone thing. And we're seeing that with this not just synchronized bond markets and bull steepening uninversion. We're also seeing it with synchronizing panic among central bankers who are cutting rates more aggressively because they realize it's not that they're behind the curve or what curve they're actually behind. They're actually realizing what yield curve information has been warning about for quite some time. They dismissed it. They downplayed it. And it's understandable why they did, given the amount of time that's in between inversion and uninversion. But this time is never different. And this globally synchronized uninversion and central bank panic, this is not about a soft landing. This is about what uninversion and bull steepening is always about, and that's, in this case, globally synchronized recession. If you want to go back and look at what those other central banks were talking about, the ECB, Switzerland, Canada, that's in the video I've got linked below. As always, thank you very much for joining me. Check out Eurodollar University's fall sale. Thank you very much to all you Eurodollar University members and subscribers. And until next time, take care.